Good morning and welcome to Mosaic. I'm Rabbi Eric Weiss and honored to be your host. Technology's force in the world is changing all sorts of ways in which we live fundamentally. It changes how we read in honor of Jewish Book Month. We're honored to have in our conversation this morning Howard Friedman, who is the executive director of the Jewish Community Library. Welcome, Howard. Thanks. It's great to be here. So why don't we jump in and tell us what's new at the Jewish Community Library? Uh, we always have things happening at the library. Um, what I'm really excited about right now is the uh, beginning of our One Bay, One Book program for the current year. One Bay, One Book is a lot like uh, a number of communities do this where they encourage people to read a single book uh, over the course of a particular time. And what we do is, is choose a Jewish-oriented book and encourage people to read it and also discuss it. Uh, and it's our selection this year is actually uh, Primo Levi's The Periodic Table. And uh, Primo Levi was a, uh, an Italian writer who was born in 1919, and he grew up in the fascist era and uh, was ultimately sent to Auschwitz. And he wrote a number of books on this experience, but this one is unlike any of those that he wrote. He and so what is One Bay, One Book? So One Bay, One Book is really, it's, the idea is that we want people to be not only reading books, but discussing them. So the idea is really that we're encouraging people to, to pick, this, pick up this book and either get together with friends or if they're part of an institution like a synagogue or a community center to, uh, to get together and, and talk about uh, the book. I, I'm really convinced after all these years as a librarian that we get such a different experience out of discussing a book than we do just out of reading it alone. And we see over time that independent bookstores are growing and the use of technology for reading in terms of the pleasure of reading is um, is kind of plateauing out it seems. I think it's it's hard to say we're, we're in a period of such radical change and it changes year to year and I think it's really difficult to to be overly general. I think for people who are saying that the physical book was on its way out there have been a lot of statistics showing that's not the case and I do think there's a lot of sort of stepping back a bit, what's happened is that we've embraced a lot of the technologies very rapidly, very enthusiastically, without assessing some of their long-term impacts and without also assessing some of the research. Uh, for instance, my kids, my, I have a daughter in middle school and she's assigned books to read on her computer. Um, I've seen that her experience is not nearly as pleasurable um, as it would be reading a physical book. Um, but and then her learning is also different. I think what we have to do is make judicious decisions about how we encourage reading and, and also what makes sense for us. I, for me, I, there's, there's not a one size fits all. I love physical books, but I also think there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of great advantages for e-readers as well. And so, what are the other services that the Jewish Community Library offers the community? Uh, well, we're a full service library, but the caveat is that we really deal only with Jewish related topics. But that said, it's really the entire range of the Jewish experience from, um, you know, religion, culture, history, music, art, and we have every possible perspective from left to right, from atheist to orthodox, because the idea is that we want to be a true community library that serves and reflects the community that we live in. So every culture struggles with how it defines itself and what is its own culture. So it's a big question, but how do you define a Jewish book? For me, it's very broad. It's that it has um, a Jewish dimension to it, meaning that it somehow reflects on or inf informs or, or tells us something about the Jewish experience that does not necessarily have to be religiously oriented. For some people, it's, it's an accidental fact of life that they were born Jewish, and yet, it, in, in the case, say, of Primo Levi, determined very much the course of his life because he was uh, imprisoned in Auschwitz because he was Jewish, even though he was a secular Jew. Um, I think that what we um, learn from books is exactly that, 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 that the breadth of the experience, the depth of the experience, at, when we see it in the big picture, is actually what we come to appreciate the Jewish experience that much more so because of how broad it is. And so, for you, the One Bay, One Book um, is essentially a book club on behalf of the Jewish Community Library. How does somebody then access that service? They would just contact us um, at jewishcommunitylibrary.org 
um, and we actually have copies that we can distribute free of charge. But we also have a lot of events um, that are related uh, to it. For instance, we, um, because the book deals with the interface of chemistry and the rest of life, uh, we have some events coming up dealing with science and uh, Judaism, or we have things dealing with Italian Jewry. Um, so we, there are events happening at the library that also enrich the experience of reading the book. But Fa we, yeah. Fantastic. We're going to take a quick break and join us in just a moment when we return to Mosaic. Welcome back to Mosaic. I'm Rabbi Eric Weiss. We're in the middle of a wonderful conversation in honor of Jewish Book Month with Howard Friedman, who is the executive director of the Jewish Community Library. Welcome back, Howard. Thank you. So what trends do you see in what we think of as Jewish books? Well, I think there are always new kinds of developments. One thing that's been really sort of gratifying in the last few years is there was a famous essay a number of years ago that uh, the literary critic Irving Howe said that basically the American Jewish literature would become less interesting the more removed we became from the immigrant generations. Mm. Uh, and whether or not that's true, what we've seen in the last couple of years is that the most exciting trend in Jewish literature has been literature by young writers born in the former Soviet Union who maybe came when they were young and are writing in English but are reflecting on their experience as American Jewish immigrants sort of caught between or torn between these two worlds of Russia and the United States um, in terms of negotiating their own identity. Some of the books are set in, in Russia, some in America, some in both, uh, and that's been a, absolutely just some great literature. What are some of their themes? Uh, well, for instance, uh, Boris Fishman wrote a book, the Re A Replacement Life, in which we have a young man who grew up largely in, he you know, was born in Russia, then grew up in Brighton Beach in the large Russian community in Brooklyn, and is trying to get out of there and to divorce himself from that very Russian world. And he moves to Manhattan, and he's just sort of sucked back into that world um, through a complicated plot around um, applying for a Holocaust restitution benefits. Um, but it's, it's an example of this sort of inner being torn and these pulls between trying to succeed in America, which has its rules, and then ultimately being formed by the Russian experience. And you've been a librarian for so many years. What do you make of this, um, this theme in the Jewish community when we talk about writing and reflecting on our experience for, for the reader of the push and pull between assimilation, becoming an American, retaining one's own culture, and one's identity, and yet living in the American world. Well, I think that's the essential American dance for Jews, uh, that when we have the opportunity to assimilate, uh, it's, it's a different sort of challenge than in other places where Jews have lived, where that opportunity was largely closed off and, and, there, and there really wasn't the same kind of um, being torn apart. Um, one of the interesting things we're seeing, another trend in, in Jewish literature, is the, uh, for lack of other word, the ex-Hasidic memoir, that we have a lot of books coming out by people who've left the ultra-Orthodox or Hasidic community and talking about that experience. In some cases, it's an angry experience. In some cases, they felt simply that they had to leave and, it's, and they still have very positive feelings. But what we see is a very insular community, a community that has done its best to, to stave off that assimilation, but still, you can't, you can't completely close, your off, close yourself off from the greater society. And that, and that category of story is mostly in the form of personal essay and memoir? It's mostly memoir. It's both men and women, but especially women. Mostly women? Yes. Interesting. And, um, and any other trends that you're seeing? Uh, one really great thing has been culinary history. We've seen a lot of books, whereas books about food used to always be cookbooks, in the recent years, we've had a lot more books on the history of Jewish food and what it tells us. So for instance, this past month, there was a book that came out uh, called Pastrami on Rye, A History of the Jewish Delicatessen. And it's really neat to, in what we think of as something just, you know, that 
uh, we think about it as food, and what the author Ted Merwin is telling us is that it actually is telling a whole narrative about American assimilation um, and how Jews see themselves relate in relation to the society in terms of the relationship to religion and how you can really uh, read all this through what we're eating. Wonderful. We're going to have a quick break and come back as we continue this conversation in honor of Jewish Book Month. Welcome back to Mosaic. I'm Rabbi Eric Weiss. We're in the middle of a wonderful conversation in honor of Jewish Book Month. And so I'd like to introduce you. Joining our conversation is Summer Brenner, who is an author and whose most recent work is in an anthology called Jewish Noir. Welcome, Summer. Thank you so much. Summer, what is Jewish Noir? I think it's important to start with the definition of noir, uh, which many people disagree upon. So that's very Jewish, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you'll get a lot of different answers about what noir is, but I'd like to offer my definition. And uh, it's, it's a sub-genre of crime writing, but I, I define it as something that's uh, harsh, violent, often a very deep social critique, somewhat assaultive, I feel like the, the, the best noir books that I've read have really kind of punched me. You know, I've had visceral feelings from reading them. And uh, it is, it is it's, it, in fact, its own genre, as is film noir, which people are quite familiar with, um, because there were many, in fact, great Jewish uh, directors and all different phases of movie making that in fleeing Europe during and before the Second World War came to Hollywood and are credited with creating what we call Jewish, uh, what we call noir film. But in fact, they came from a Jewish sensibility and many of them, not all. And they came, of course, from a place of persecution. Um, there's a story in the anthology Jewish Noir where the writer comments that, you know, noir, it's a very popular term. You might say a hip term. And that a lot of in, in publicizing books, they want to brand a book as noir. But in fact, people want to be identified with that term. But when it comes to publishing actual noir, it's much, much harder. And so you have a piece yes, in this anthology. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your particular piece. Well, my story is called Devil for a Witch, and it comes from an old Southern expression, you trade a devil for a witch, which is not a bargain on either end. So my protagonist, Leon Greenberg, is in financial straits, he's committed crimes, and he gets an offer from the FBI that he can die and go underground into a clandestine operation in Mississippi undercover to try to identify some of the patrician class that are financing the Klan and not only their virulent and violent campaign against African Americans during this period, uh, but also their virulent and violent anti-Semitism. And so I suppose every author gets a variation of this question, but to what degree is your story fiction and to what degree is it based in current events or historic reality? Well, my, my story takes place in the 1960s and it's fueled by the fact that I actually attended the temple in Atlanta, Georgia, where I grew up, and that temple was bombed. And uh, it was bombed particularly because of the rabbi, Jacob Rothstein's, Rothschild, excuse me, Jacob Rothschild's uh, very vocal and public affiliation with Dr. King. That would have been, I think, the primary motivation. There's been a book called The Temple Bombing 
that uh, Melissa Fay Green has written that's a nonfiction book about that time. But as a child experiencing that, it was an experience, not my only experience, but my most extreme experience of domestic terror. Mm. Howard, you talked earlier about trends in Jewish books, and here we have noir, and specifically Jewish noir. Is this, is this kind of literature new f within the context of the Jewish community? No, it's not, actually. I mean, we are seeing more of it. There's more Jewish detective fiction. There's actually even a, a large uh, subgenre in, in Israel of, of, uh, of detective fiction. But there's also... Uh, Actually, this, uh, this fall, there's the release of Meyer Levin's novel, Compulsion, which was about the Leopold and Loeb case. There was a fictional take uh, from that. And one of the things that's interesting from that, this was a book written, I don't remember if it was in the 50s or 60s, um, but there's always been a great discomfort among Jews with, um, with violence and with, I mean, we all are uncomfortable with violence, but when it happens within the community and some of the novels that are happening are sort of... A, showing the underbelly, the, the parts that we don't like to acknowledge uh, that happen among Jews. Um, and so I think that's something that's explored in a lot. It, it was explored certainly in Compulsion, and it's explored in, in a number of novels coming out today. Interesting. We're going to take a quick break and return in just a moment here to Mosaic. <laughs> Welcome back to Mosaic. I'm Rabbi Eric Weiss. We're in the middle of a wonderful conversation with author Summer Brenner and the executive director of the Jewish Community Library here in San Francisco, Howard Friedman. Well, welcome back, Howard and Summer. Thank you. Summer, every anthology has a rationale behind it. So can you talk a little bit about what you understand to be the rationale and essentially the framing of Jewish noir? Yes, well, I, I spoke about the definition of war, noir itself, but why Jewish noir? And I think Howard brought in a good dimension about how more and more Jewish writers are writing about the underbelly or the crime. But in the uh, introduction to the anthology Jewish noir, the editor, Ken Wishner, has done an extremely erudite uh, explanation that goes back, in fact, to many references in the Bible where crimes are committed, where the heroes that are lionized in, in biblical literature are actually flawed and in, imperfect beings struggling with their own demons. And so the, the introduction is, is, is very, very important in terms of setting the tone of the book. And then what follows are actually 30-plus authors writing in very different voices about very different subjects. So you get a, a, just a great wide range of Jewish perspectives on what a crime story is. And is Jewish noir or the, the genre of noir by definition intended to elicit a, a, a visceral reaction from the reader? Is that part of its requirement? No. I think that that was something that I was personally defining and, and my own response to some things that I've read and also some of the stories that are in this anthology, but not, not all of them. And as I said, you know, there's many definitions of noir and people will tell you things that, uh, you know, would, would either complement or even maybe contradict some of the things I've said. So I have kind of a big question for both of you. Jewish life is filled with a relationship to text, a kind of love affair with the word. And in that context, every culture has its own hesitancy about revealing perhaps to the broader world or even to itself, whatever its underbelly might be. And so what do you think is going on for us in the Jewish community, perhaps here in America, that we're seeing some literature that takes, in some ways, that risk to both reveal to the world and to ourselves a bit of this underbelly? For me, I think that there's this, you know, there's an expression in Yiddish, to be a shanda fardigoyim, to, to be a shame in front of non-Jews. There's a sense of insecurity that Jews as, as immigrants or people who felt that they haven't fully belonged. Uh, there's an insecurity feeling that 
we have to look good in front of others and we don't want to show those, you know, the airing dirty laundry. And the fact that there's more dirty laundry probably is an indication of, greater, uh, of a greater feeling of security. Interesting. So perhaps this literature signifies a kind of security or maturity um, in some ways on behalf of the community itself to sort of say, well, we are like everybody else and, and this is a part of what makes us human as well. Mm -hmm. Exposing ourselves. Exposing ourselves mm -hmm. for self-reflective capacity and... So we have just a little bit more time left. Let's talk a little bit about a genre we haven't talked about yet, which is children's literature. And I'm wondering, Summer, from your perspective as an author, um, what about children's literature in the Jewish world and, and Howard as well from the perspective of the Jewish Community Library? So, Summer. Yes, well, for a decade I've been writing young adult books, young, young adults, so early teen books, middle school. and. They're all place-based, and the first one is called uh, Ivy Homeless in San Francisco, and it's about a, a, a girl, a 12-year-old um, girl, and her, her father, her artist father, who are homeless. So it addresses the city as a character in the way that they move around and, and, and camp out, and she, she's prevented most, of the, most days from going to school. And so it, it addresses homelessness and has been used in classrooms to introduce the conversation, to open the conversation about homelessness uh, in classrooms where, again, you know, kids are embarrassed to talk about it and they're ashamed or they're afraid. And so it's been a catalyst for discussion. Wonderful. Interesting. But, but the, the other two books, that uh, one about Richmond and one about Oakland, are even more specifically about place because they time travel back into the history of a place and they try to create bridges among very diverse cultures. So while the protagonist of both those books is an African-American girl and a Latino boy, there are characters that enter into the book that are from all um, periods of history, but all in contemporary life, the diverse world that we're living in. Lovely. We're about to end, so we're gonna have to put a comma in the conversation among us. As we end, Howard, do you have, say, one book that you would recommend folks try out? Um, well, since I talked about the Russian immigrant authors, I would say A Bear, A Backpack, and Eight Crates of Vodka uh, by Lev Golinkin, which is a memoir. Wonderful. And Summer, one book. Well, I think I'd like to recommend Jewish Noir. It's a wonderful Christmas or Hanukkah present. Wonderful. Please enjoy the rest of your day and, of course, get a book and read and talk about it. Thank you so much for being with us here on Mosaic. Thank you.